Okay, our next topic for discussion is pulmonary embolus. Now, pulmonary embolus can follow many things. It can follow, most commonly, DVT, deep venous thrombosis. It can follow delivery, where it comes as an amniotic fluid embolus. It can follow fractures, usually of the long bones, where you can get fat emboli. And symptoms the patients are going to present with include tachypnea, chest pain, dyspnea, as well as hemoptysis from the lung infarct itself. Patients will present with hypotension, and in severe cases, they may even present with death. Now, our first test on pulmonary embolus is always going to be the chest x-ray. But rarely on chest x-ray will it be abnormal. And if the case gives a clear-cut history of pulmonary embolus with a sudden onset of shortness of breath with clear lungs, what I want you to do is I want you to go straight to treatment with heparin, meaning if it's one of these things where the patient has been immobile for a prolonged period of time after delivery, one of these things that's clear-cut PE with a sudden onset of shortness of breath after you do your chest x-ray, you're going to go straight to treatment with heparin. Now, like I said, chest x-ray is usually normal, but once in a while it may be abnormal. And by abnormal, I mean you may actually see a wedge-shaped infarct due to the pulmonary infarct. And if the chest x-ray is abnormal, it's rare, you're going to confirm this with a spiral CT. If the chest x-ray is normal, which is oftentimes the case, you're going to do a VQ scan. So your first is chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray is abnormal, you're going to confirm it with a spiral CT. If the chest x-ray is normal, which is usually the case, you're going to confirm it with a VQ scan. Now on the VQ scan, you're going to see certain findings. If you see the classic pattern of mismatched perfusion between ventilation and perfusion, you're going to go straight to treatment with heparin and warfarin. Okay, so if classic pattern of mismatched perfusion on VQ, straight to treatment with heparin and warfarin. If it's normal, if the VQ is normal, you did the chest x-ray, it was normal, you did the VQ scan now and it's normal, at this point you can rule out any significant pulmonary thromboembolism. And if the VQ scan is indeterminate or inconclusive, this is where it gets a little tricky, okay? You're going to do a venous duplex of the lower extremity or a CT angiogram of the chest. Chest x-ray is normal, VQ is indeterminate or inconclusive. If the venous ultrasound or CT is negative, you're going to do a pulmonary angiography. But if you see a DVT on this venous duplex, you're going to go ahead and go straight to treatment. Okay, so if, if the, the VQ scan is indeterminate or inconclusive, you're going to do a venous duplex of the lower extremity or CT angiogram of the chest. If the venous ultrasound or CT is negative, that's when you're going to have to go to the pulmonary angiography. But if you see a DVT, you're going to go straight to treatment. And on pulmonary angiography, if it's positive, you're going to start heparin and warfarin. Pulmonary embolus, if you did the chest x-ray, and the patient, and there's a high index for suspicion of pulmonary embolus, and the patient is hemodynamically unstable, you're going to do a bedside echo and start thrombolytics. But before you start the thrombolytics, you have to make sure, remember, you have to make sure they're not on any other type of anticoagulants, and you also have to make sure that there's no contraindications to these thrombolytics. And if the patient has a contraindication to TPA, you're going to do a surgical embolectomy. Now that's if the patient's hemodyna hemodynamically unstable. If the patient is hemodynamically stable and there's contraindications to anticoagulation or if there's failure of warfarin failure, you're going to put in an IVC filter, also known as a Greensfield filter. So by treatment, when I was talking about treatment, you're going to do heparin and warfarin at the same time. Why are you giving heparin and warfarin at the same time? Because warfarin is actually going to pre uh, prevent HIT. It's going to prevent heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. That's why we're giving it at the same time, and we're not giving it a couple of days after like they used to do in olden days. Remember the treatment for heparin-induced um, thrombocytopenia, if it does happen, is what? It's the direct thrombin inhibitors, Argatroban and Lipiridin, right? So we're going to treat with heparin and warfarin, but we got to keep them on warfarin, and we taper them off heparin. And how do we know how long we keep them on warfarin for? Well, if it's in the setting of reversible risk factors, such as oral contraceptive pills, immobility, or surgery, you're going to put them on warfarin for three to six months. 
If it's idiopathic thromboembolism, you're going to put them on warfarin for six months. If it's an underlying malignancy, if they have anti-cardiolipin antibodies or they have anti-thrombin deficiency, you're going to put them on warfarin for 12 months. And if it's a recurrent thrombo thromboemboli, you're going to put them on warfarin for life. So this is your algorithm for pulmonary embolism. It tells you everything, how to diagnostically work them up, how to treat them, how long to treat them for, and all the different clinical scenarios they can throw at you. Okay? Enjoy.